Alrighty, it looks like we have a good number of attendees here already. Uh, welcome everyone this evening to our equine seminar series. Uh, as a reminder, my name is Kelly Nickelbein. I'm one of the ophthalmologists here at Cornell. Um, wanted to just remind everyone about our next seminar um, for November, which will be on Tuesday, November 21st. Dr. Mandy Demestra will be presenting on prevention of pregnancy loss in mares, and we hope you can all join us for that. Um, this evening, we're very excited to have Dr. Santi Mejia here um, to present on equine emergencies. Um, Santi grew up in Colombia riding Pasifino and quarter horses. Um, he's trained um, all over the United States, including in Kentucky and North Carolina. He did an internship at Ruffian, um, where he's now an equine surgeon, um, and he did his equine surgery residency, um, or large animal surgeon, surgery residency, rather, here at Cornell in Ithaca. Um, so again, Dr. Santi is a surgeon at Ruffian, where he sees emergencies, as well as orthopedic and soft tissue cases. Um, and we'll go ahead and get started with his presentation this evening on Equine Emergency 101, What to Do When the Worst Happens. Um, we will be taking question, relevant questions throughout the talk tonight. So if you have a relevant question, if you can go ahead and put it in, in the Q&A and we'll address them as they come in. Um, if we've already moved on from the topic when the question comes in, we'll do some more Q&A at the end. Alrighty, go for it, Santi. Hey, Dr. Nicobine. Um So uh, first of all, thanks everybody for attending. This is uh, quite an honor to be here and I hope this is of, of use for some of you. Um, so the topic, like Dr. Nicobon says, is equine emergencies 101. And I hope I can go through the most common equine emergencies that we see, um, especially here at Cornell Ruffian um, in some of the areas that I um, work on. Um, so for once, I, I my basic role here is, is a, mostly as a uh, as a surgeon, but I do a fair number of uh, equine emergencies and sport medicine at uh, the practice. And um, I had like a little bit of a rundown of my experience. Uh, so like Dr. Nicobain said, um, I was a, an intern here at Ruffian. Prior to that, I did a couple other internships at um, Hager Equine Medical Institute and um, NC State University as a rotating intern. And then I went to Columbia for a year and practiced as an ambulatory uh, vet and then came back to pursue further training. Um, some of my professional interests are minimal invasive surgery, soft tissue surgery, um, lameness, and orthobiologics. That's kind of where the gross of my residency research was based on. And I got it. Luckily, I had a fair number of experience in operary surgery. And my frustrated passion are fit, feet conditions, so laminitis and podiatry, but I just realized very early on that I wasn't tough enough for the job, so I just decided to keep it as a hobby. Um, moving on, we're going to go from what kind of what is the difference between an emergency and an urgency, uh, go over the normal physiologic variables in a horse and in a foal. Uh, when should we be alert when something is wrong? Um, what can we have as a basic first aid kits? Uh, and what are the most common equine emergencies and kind of how to deal with them? So an emergency is basically is a life-threatening health condition that require immediate medical attention or that animal or person will die. Um, and an urgency is not a life-threatening condition, but needs medical attention as soon as possible before things get complicated or escalated. Uh, so an urgency needs to be seen as soon as possible, but doesn't need to be soon seen right away versus an emergency that needs to be seen right away. Okay. So... What is the no the normal physiological variables in adult horse in the fall? Um, so for an uh, for an um, in the fall, we'll see the heart rate should be around eighty to one twenty, and this will drop to normal uh, to a adult horse numbers about three to four months or even younger. Um, and then the respiratory rate is going to be around twenty to forty respirations per minute. 
Uh, and an adult horse is going to be around age 16. Mucous membranes, we looked at the color, the moisture, uh, the appearance, any abnormalities that I'm going to show you in a little bit and colors and, and, and stuff that can indicate of a, of a problem. Then the GA track is honestly, it, it's, it's, we, talk about, we talk about increased gut sounds, decreased gut sounds, absent gut sounds, and normal gut sounds. Um, so that's kind of where I go up if, if, if to kind of determine. It's not an objective, it's a very subjective variable that we measure. Um, the rectal temperature will vary between 98 to 101.5, and, uh, and falls can go up to 102, and they, that could be considered normal, and especially in young falls, uh, depending on the situation. And then also want to assess for hydration. How do the eyes look like? Are they sunken in the skull? Are they dry, glass looking? What is the skin? Do we have a tent? The skin test is when you pull the skin, it stays there. Um, the mucous membranes, are they dry? Are they pink? Are they tacky? All of these characteristics will give us information about what is the hydration status of the horse. And then uh, feces, they tend to pat about six to eight piles in 24 hours in full is going to pass around four to six piles in 24 hours. Those are harder to to measure because they usually get, get hidden on the in the shavings or straw. And then they usually should nurse between four to six times per hour. That means every 15 to 20 minutes. And they usually urinate after each nursing. So all of those things are key to watch for the falls when they're especially when they're young. So this is a picture of a horse, it's not taken by me, and here is a zoom out of an areas that you can palpate, for example, if you don't have a stethoscope, areas that you can palpate the pulse. So in the transverse facial, um, it's going to be right here, uh, let me show you, transverse facial is going to be around here uh, in this area, and then uh, your lingual facial, um, sorry, your facial already and then going to be here. And then you can also go to your um, palm or digital nerve and artery, which is right here with the digital pulses. That'll be another area that you can um, put your fingers on it and feel for a pulse if in absence of a stethoscope. Uh, those are practical and easy areas that you can feel a pulse in a horse. To listen to the heart, uh, which is a lot of owners will keep a stethoscope in their in their first aid uh, material. And usually we listen to the heart on the left side, but I like in, if you're looking for a horse that has a heart condition or you're looking for a heart condition, a horse, of course, you want to ascultate both sides of the thorax. If you're just looking for a number to see what the heart rate is, the left side is the easier. And then you can also ascultate their lungs, how they're breathing, especially in horses that have hives or allergic conditions. They might be having difficulty breathing. And then for the GI tract, we look at here the flank area and both sides. So I usually ascultate in the top and then the bottom. And we we kind of talk about four quadrants. So one upper and, and lower on each side. And then when do we look for mild to moderate abnormal clinical signs in a horse? And this is not a specific for a, like in this specific condition, this is kind of generally speaking, a horse that is not eating, that is acting depressed, uh, pr uh, probably resting more than normal. When you say like, oh, he usually rests at nine, he lays down, but in the day he's pretty active, but suddenly he's been resting all day. That probably is not normal for that horse. However, in the other hand, you might have a horse that's totally the opposite. So knowing your horse and his normal habits is going to help you detect early on mild clinical signs that could be missed if you're not paying attention. Um, also changes in attitude, such as uh, horses that are becoming aggressive, some horses that are becoming maybe some neurologic. Um, uh, fevers will put these horses off feed and make them act a little dumpy uh or depressed um so always we recommend to check the temperature at least once a day if possible 
And then overall, go over your horse, look for abnormal mucous membranes, uh, how they're looking like. And then I'm going to show you a few examples of what, what a normal looks like in some of the conditions. So in the top left here, you will see a nice pink, moist, and kind of bright mucous membranes. Uh, versus the top right, uh, you will see a kind of icteric, uh, slightly red um, and mucous membrane. This is a horse that had hepatic encephalopathy, um, which is a liver condition that can uh, progress to neurologic signs. Here we have a youngster with a what well, we took a tall as a toxic halo, which is this kind of reddish to purple uh, delineation of his uh, gums that shows that he's going through a toxic process, usually associated with any endotoxemia or bacteria. Um, here is a horse with uh, endotoxemia, severe endotoxemia. What we're seeing is petechia, which is kind of this uh, microscopic hemorrhages uh, on the mucous membranes uh, because of damage on the vasculature. And so when they become bigger, they become like echematic. Uh, so this is a very sick horse right here. And then one in the bottom is a nycteric horse, is a horse that Basically, it could be having a liver issue like an hepatitis uh, or any sore uh, or sometimes horses that haven't eaten in a while, they can become a little bit of icteric because uh, accumulation of bilirubin. Other more serious clinical signs they want to look for, for example, an eye is always an emergency. So every time you see a horse that is left for a spasm, that means it's keeping his eyes shut having um, reaction to the light, so that we call photophobia, or doesn't want to open the eye when there is light directly to his, um, basically directly to his eye. Um, that is indicative of there's something going on in the eye. Also, sometimes preocular uh, edema, like this horse, uh, some of them can have abscesses or trauma uh, that we just didn't realize sometimes when they're in the pasture. A normal nasal discharge, like in this horse right here, it's kind of green mucoid discharge. It's very typical horses that are choking or having esophageal obstructions. Uh, so also that is abnormal. This secretion can also be green purulent, like when they have sinus problems. So any secretion in the nasal uh, that is other than clear, transparent, non-odorous, it should be considered abnormal. A horse that's profuse sweating for no reason always is a sign of alarm. Uh, we should look at how closely what's going on to that horse. Or any lameness that looks like four out of five and five out of five. For those who don't know, uh, the A, B, A, B scale goes from one to five, being um, a horse that a one is kind of hard to see, but only in special conditions, not consistent. And then you have a grade two that is only seen in a special conditions, like being under saddle or in soft footing or in a circle. A grade three is always consistent at the trot. And a grade four is a lame of the walk. And a grade five is non way bearing lameness. And this scale is not perfect, of course, like anything else, but it kind of gives you a reference or in, in the help in urns to understand the degree of lameness in the horse. Now, more serious clinical signs, we can go like a horse that was rolling continuously, pawing, kicking at the belly repeatedly, is it, that's not able to stand up, maintaining his posture um, in the stall, in the middle, inability to move because it has ataxia, any profuse bleeding from any natural orifice uh, or hemorrhage, um, difficulty breathing, uh, flaring nostrils, distress, increased respiratory rate, those are basically signs that is probably something more serious going on in that horse and will need immediate medical attention. So what do we do in these situations? So the most important thing in an emergency, uh, oops, sorry. Uh, the most important thing in an emergency situation, sorry, just jump here, uh, is don't have, um, don't panic is the first thing. I know that it's hard to do, because emergencies are emotional. They're emotional situations. And sometimes when they're happening, we don't think straight. 
we tend to react with the emotions of the moment. And sometimes we get a little bit of a tunnel vision of what's going on. So the first thing is uh, understand that they don't have any time or date. They can happen at any time. It's better to be ready for an emergency instead of having trying to be ready when things are happening. A lot of the times we don't have a lot of time. So we need to be ready for them. Emergencies, like I said, they tend to be emotional. Always key things you want to know is keep your vet, your shipper, uh, the phone numbers handy so you can call them. Um, if you have your insurance, give them a heads up. This always helps. Um, and then this is the most one of the most difficult things because no one planned for it. Uh, but being financial or organize yourself financially, it's the best because it's going to be an expense. And especially here in the U.S., um, things are expensive and the care of the horses, is, 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 it can get expensive very quickly. Um, and the, one of the hardest things to do is keep calm when you can. So some of the basic things that you could have at your farm, this will all of this will be in a can fit on a backpack that you can carry with you in your tack materials and your uh, anywhere you keep your saddle, your bridles and stuff like that. You can keep a thermometer, which you can get from as, as cheap as $10 to as expensive as $300. So a pretty average $50 to $60 stethoscope will do the trick that you need to listen to the heart. Um, a flashlight in the case of a um, night situation, a thermometer, some exam gloves, uh, any wound creams that you can apply in, a, uh, in wounds that are uh, that needed. Anti-inflammatory such as vanamine or bute, usually paste we recommend or, or tablets in case of bute. If for some reason you only have injectable, you can always give uh, flunixin, uh, megalamine, or banamine orally, the injectable form. Horses hate the taste, uh, but study have shown it has good viability. Uh, and then I think it's close to 80%, 87%. So they still going to have a good uh, uh, anti-inflammatory and pain effect to these uh, horses if that's the only one you have. Any antiseptic solutions uh, such as chlorhexidine, iodine, alcohol is always good to have. Some scissors some saline solution and PVC pipes is it's good to have, honestly. And this is more for a fracture, a cut tendon that you need to put something in there to for either transportation or to stabilize a, a leg. And um, this is like less critical because ideally if you're in this stage, you want to have a vet there. Um, but sometimes it's good to have it handy. And then for bandage materials are good to have. Uh, Elasticon, vet wrap, non sterile gauze for vet force, any combine cotton roll, standing wraps, duct tape, and diapers. Uh, all of this you can get either in a pharmacy or Amazon. None of this is hard to get. And if you can keep your stock of it, you can do a lot of things with these materials. Santi, we have a question in the Q&A about administration of banamine orally. Yep. Should it Does it just need to go in the mouth or should it specifically go under the tongue? Just go in the mouth. And I usually don't mix it with molasses because some of the molasses component can inactivate some of the medications. So I usually, if you have some applesauce or something they like, uh, you can mix it up a little bit because it tastes horrible. They hate it. Um, so, but anywhere, if you can squirt it anywhere in the mouth, especially, uh, if, if you're not comfortable giving IV injections and the tricky with any IV injection is, especially with burobanamine is it, if it comes out of the vein, it's pretty irritant, uh, and they can develop abscesses, they can damage the nerves and some horses can develop, uh, problems on their larynx because of damage to one nerve that goes in the, on that side of the neck. Um, also one thing to say about banamine is in, in the label of the, of the bottle says you can give it IM, but for the love of God, please never give it IM. Uh, there's plenty of research that's shown that horses that get banamine or viewed IM are, can develop or are in high risk of developing clostridial myositis. And that could be pretty, um, pretty bad for some horses. Uh, so I rather if you if injectable is all the thing you is all you have and you're not comfortable giving an IV, give it an orally. 
uh, not butte, but banamine can be given orally, um, and that should do just fine. Would that answer the question? That's great, Santi. Yes, thank you. And then just a follow-up question to that. Does oral banamine take longer to kick in relative to intravenous banamine? That's a great question. And the answer is yes. Intravenous is almost immediate uh, effect, five to 10 minutes. They, you should start having high concentrations versus oral, you can take about 45 minutes to an hour to get C effects. Um, but it is effective. Um, if you have a horse that is, for example, acutely colicky, like painful, very thrashing himself to the ground, there is no IV vanamine that is going to keep that horse comfortable. So you better call your vet as soon as possible because no vanamine is going to keep that horse comfortable. Um, moving on, so some of the most common equine emergencies that we see here, um, and number one for us is going to be colic. Uh, after that, it's going to be wounds. Um, Eye, eye emergencies that involve several, and we're going to talk about them later. Fevers of unknown origin or known origin. Any esophageal obstructions, such as choke with foreign bodies, feed material, um, lamenesses, and neurologic problems. I got to say, at least in our practice, neurologic emergencies is it's not that common. We see one or two a year that are true, true, true neurologic emergencies. Uh, to start about colic, um, the first thing we wanna know is kind of understand what's colic. Um, and first of all, is a symptom, it's not a disease process. Um, and then it's a broad veterinary term to describe uh, abdominal pain uh, that could be coming from any of this tract, the GI tract, the urogenital tract, the respiratory tract. The most common one is the GI tract. In this case, is a video of a mare that has a large colon volvulus postpartum. Uh, she falls, I think, um, and the odd thing about this one is that she was actually, uh, I think, a month off or three weeks post falling that she developed the volvulus. So like you can see in this video, um, she was pretty, pretty painful. Uh, she was heavily sedated. The mare was thrashing in the stall right there. She's trying to go down. We're trying to triage the, the mare, give us some hypertonic uh, to restore some of the circulating volume. And she has another catheter on the other side, giving her some crystalloid fluids to try to keep it hydrated. And of course, there's always the fear that in the process of her getting uncomfortable, she can injure her fall. So now I'm gonna show you a quick video clip. I, For the record, I did not make this video. This was actually um, shared to me when I was an intern in NC State, but one of the uh, senior clinicians, Dr. Jen Davis, um, she recorded this video to kind of show different types of clinical signs of horses with colic. And, um, and mo none of the, uh, the horses were restrained from medical care, what we're all recording, um, just for disclosure purposes. Um, let's see what it plays. So the first one is kind of flipping the lip. This is your classic, very mild horse uh, colic sign, flank watching. It's also considered a mild sign. Uh, and they kind of sit there and, and flank watch. When they're doing it very actively, flank watching, uh, um, you know, flipping the lip, uh, pawing, all those signs of combination make it more uh, like a more moderate signs. But when they're just kind of one or the other, they're more milder. This is a horse that's kind of can't get comfortable anywhere. It just doesn't know what to do. Um, so that's also another clear sign of discomfort. This horse had a bad colitis and, you know, it's pawing very aggressively. It's trying to go down, trying to kick his belly. Um, pretty uncomfortable. You can see kind of painting the walls with manure uh, in several areas. 
This is another horse with more aggressive pawing. Um, This horse was, uh, after an orthopedic procedure, he developed colic um, and it's kind of classical kicking at the belly. This one trying to go down. Um, some horses will kind of go down and lay there. All the ones will try to roll or go in, on flat. Um, this one tried to roll, but hit the wall, of course, so she just kind of laid there. This is a pretty marked abdominal distension. Like you see, this horse has very shallow breathing, having hard, hard time breathing. This is a youngster having a uh, colic signs, typical, usually young, young uh, yearlings or winglings. They tend to be more dramatic, but I always find that they're pretty honest. Uh, when they're, when they're rolling or showing colic signs, they're, they're usually uh, something is wrong. Um, other common causes of colic, I try to group them in a more general ca categories. So you have in intestinal dysfunction, such as gas, spasmodic colics, cramping, ileus, uh, or obstructions. There are other types of colics are going to be more intestinal accidents. Those are going to be displacements, torsions, volvulus, strangulation, lesions, and then inflammatory causes are going to be more... Um, um, in fact, uh, in inflammatory infections and ulcerative causes are going to be your colitis, enteritis, gastric ulcers. Um, so this is, this is a kind of broad category to group them. So what can we do as owners? Uh, first, if you can evaluate the degree of discomfort of your horse, try to assess if you can with a physical examination, just take a heart rate, respiratory rate if you can. Because your vet is going to ask you like, oh, how uncomfortable is he? Were you able to take a heart rate? Uh, some of them will ask you that. Some of them won't. Uh, but if, let's say, if you took it, you can say, hey, his heart rate is so-and-so, is 60. So at least give the vet an idea how painful is the horse. Um, and then after you talk to your vet, he might indicate you, why don't you give some banamine if you have it, or I'll be there short. We'll treat it when I get there. Um, most important thing is try to remove feed until fecal output is or and signs are resolved. A lot of clients I see that the horse is colicky and when they're mild and then they keep feeding the horse and it's like, oh, he was kind of colicky, give him banami and they feed him again and he went for it, but then he got colicky again. So the first thing to do is do not feed the horse. Uh, they can have water, but don't feed the horse. You can hand walk the horse, but uh, you don't need to walk the horse for five hours. But if, if in 20, 30 minutes, your horse is not more comfortable, an hour is not going to make a difference. Uh, so that's important. Like we don't want you to be walking a horse for hours and hours. Uh, ideally, you kind of take it for a 10, 15 minutes hand walk, put him back in the stall, see what his comfort is at that point. Um, and then the magical therapeutic trailer ride, I think we all have been there and all uh, uh, experienced this. Is some horses are very colicky at the farm. They go on a trailer, and by the time they get to the hospital, they're fixed. They pass two nice piles in the trailer. They're acting like nothing happened, and you're like, Mom, why do you bring me here? Um, so those horses, we usually keep them regardless, and we do a full exam. Because the, the worst thing that can happen is we put them back in the, in the trailer, and they're colicky back in the house. So... Uh, ideally, you want to give them fluids, kind of restore that uh, motility in the intestines and kind of keep them going. And then most importantly, what not to do. So first of all, do not feed the horse, like we told you earlier. Don't give any NSAIDs like banamine or bute, especially IM or subcutaneously, and especially without your vet's recommendation. Um, other thing, do not give any mineral oil with a syringe, uh, through the mouth. Uh, I've, I've heard people through my career that give some, um, you know, mineral oil through the mouth because they think that's going to lubricate and, and they think that's going to, um, maybe soften the stool. But in reality, a syringe of 60, 60 cc is not going to do anything. 
uh, for uh, for a horse with, let's say, an impaction. So don't there is more risk of those things going to the lungs than actually benefiting the horse. Uh, do not attempt to do any rectal exams or introduce any time of foreign objects. I've heard about people introducing hosts to their rectums, which it is a practice in veterinary medicine as a, as a control enema uh, under direct medical guidance. It, there's times, there's a time and a place for it, but I would never recommend a client to do that because there are many things that can go wrong. Um, do not administer any water orally via hose. The same thing. Uh, it can most likely is going to end up in the lungs. Dr. Mejia, we have a question about whether or not you should let your horse lay down when they're having colic signs. So there is this classic uh, thought that um, if they lay down and roll, they're going to twist the gut. Um, the reality is no one knows, but chances are it's not going to happen. Um, but if it is, if a horse that you cannot keep comfortable because it's very uncomfortable all the time you took him for a walk and he's trying to go down on you is more safer for the horse and for you to leave the horse in the stall, let him roll, let him do his thing while the vet gets there. If you have some sort of sedation that you can give orally or intramuscularly like ACE or Xalazine or dorm gel that you can give orally while the vet gets there, that'll probably be the safest. They're trying to walk the horse as it's trying to go down. Um, also, you know, for prevention, most horse owners know this, but keeping a clean diet, balanced nutrition, more fiber, more forage, less carbohydrates, that means grain, that shouldn't be, that shouldn't be the base of their diet. Make sure they have access to clean water, mineral blocks for supplementation, especially in the areas where there are mineral vitamin deficiencies, such as here in New York. Um, split the feeding instead of being big feedings at one or twice a day. Just have the horse eat smaller feedings throughout the day. Monitor the fecal urinary output, monitor water intake, dental exams routinely. And when I say dental exam routinely, there's a misconception as far as dental exam equals floating a teeth. Because what you're doing is taking about six months uh, of life of that tooth every time you rasp it. So we take a more, uh, at least here in Cornell, a more um, uh, preventative approach or more conservative approach. So we only file the teeth that are actually causing buccal laceration or lingual lacerations uh, on that horse. If they're not causing that, um, they probably need to not need to be filed. Just remember you're taking life span with that teeth every time you're rasping. So dental exam is meant to check the teeth, not necessarily meant to rasp the teeth. That's a big difference. And then of course, objective deworming based on fecal counts and exercise, aptic exercise is going to be very, very beneficial, either being ridden or just have them loose in a pasture. Moving on from colics, does anybody have any questions regardless colics, or can we move on? No questions pending right now. Okay. Puncture, abrasions, and laceration. This is a very dramatic, this is a, uh, it's not a picture of mine, but this is classical of a horse that goes through a barbed wire or something, or a pointing metal in a door, and he just kind of run through it and, you know, scrape his skin. So what are the difference? An abrasion is what we see here, um, not the one that is suture in the middle, but kind of the ones here in top and here in the middle of the knee. Uh, there are kind of partial thickness. The skin is partially removed, but there's nothing to suture. And then lacerations is this. You have like a big gap, full thickness um, and uh, or partial thickness on the skin. And then puncture wounds are this one here in the bot in the uh, right hand side of the screen, where it's like a penetrating wound with a very small opening. And we're going to talk about individually. So, what to do uh, when you have a laceration? So always call your vet, uh, and the reason for that is, um, especially when you noting notice some of these following things. One. If you have a horse that is profusely bleeding, a lot of the times 
either the laceration is big enough, deep enough that cut a lot of muscle or a lot of uh, soft tissue or they lacerate a big vessel. You, those are the ones that are kind of spraying blood at you. All the lacerations are kind of over joints, tendons, or synovial structures. They should be seen by the vet immediately. Uh, or a wound that is deep, big, or long enough that requires suture or surgical debridement. Um, any presence of foreign bodies. Um, and, and then also just to remind that you make sure you keep your horse up to date on tendons vaccines. That's going to help you or help prevent some of the uh, tendons that can develop for a traumatic laceration. So how do we manage abrasions? So usually, first thing, the vet is going to ask you, where is the abrasion located? How big is it? Where uh, Can you send me a picture? So take a picture of the laceration, the abrasion, and set your vet. Um, ideally, uh, if you can clip the area, kind of clean it with an antiseptic or saline solution. Uh, if you don't have any antiseptic or saline, you can use water um, to clean it. But ideally, wounds must be cleaned with uh, saline. Um, and then let's say if it's superficial, doesn't require your vet to go in there and do something more invasive. Um, a lot of the times, like a debridement dressing to try to remove some of the foreign material that could be stick to the abrasion. You can use some hydrogels. You can those be get at any CVS, Walgreens pharmacy. Those are great to debride the wounds. Oops, sorry. Um, and... Uh, make sure that the the wounds are bandaged afterwards. The reason for that is the pressure is going to help the tissues to not get so much infl inflammation and also it's going to keep the wounds clean and covered. Um, also, if the wounds are exposed, they're going to dry out. And there's always this misconception that scabbing is good. But ideally, you want to have a wound that is kind of moist and 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 clean for the cells to migrate and heal versus a scab because that can delay a little bit of your healing. So how do we manage a laceration and deep wounds? So first thing is think about if you need veterinary assistance. Nine out of ten, the correct answer is yes, you will need um, ven uh, veterinary assistance, especially if you have hemorrhage. Uh, if the wound is too big, they will need sutures um, or the location. Is it going to be near a, a near or over a synovial structure? Um, in the case of having a hemorrhage, things you can do to try to prevent this or for getting worse is a pressure bandage. So that's when your kit will come handy. If you can put a pressure bandage, your vet is going to take it off as soon as you see the horse, but at least you're stopping the bleeding. A tourniquet will also help. Uh, you can leave a tourniquet for about two hours in the horse without minimal to not uh, detrimental effects. Um, and then some people might have hemostats that you can, if you see a vessel that are bleeding and you can kind of clamp it. Um, I've seen owners that are nurses and they're kind of familiar with that situation and they just clamp and they come to the clinic with a forcep on the vessel. And then basic stuff you want to do if you can, uh, clean and clip and disinfect the wounds when possible. Um, one tip here that is good is if you can add a sterile gel uh, to the wound bed, that will prevent from hair to go inside the wound and getting all contaminated. And then any wound should be repaired in the golden time, which is going to be six to eight hours or so. Um, here, this is a wound on the back of the, on the hind limb where, you, where you're seeing is kind of like V-shaped flap. The tricky side of this wound is that it's very close to the tendon sheath that lives here and the fetlock joint that lives here. So you always want to assess for contamination or involvement of those synovial structures. What, what, what not to do is don't put any creams or ointments or sprays without your vet seeing or consent of them. Um, Benign neglect can be backfire you and wounds that are, could be manageable become a problem. This is a horse that I actually took care of it. And I'm gonna show you some follow-up pictures of this case. Um, and always remember, not every, not every wound can be sutured. And 
especially if they're highly contaminated, there is gross, uh, like great real state of skin loss, um, or there's too macerated, too damaged to even try to suture. Uh, and a good mantra to live, uh, sorry, uh, a good mantra to live at is never put anything in the wound that you will not put in your eye. So if you don't put alcohol in your eye, you shouldn't be putting alcohol in the wound. Um, just to, as a rule follower. This is an example of a, a, of a laceration I saw during my residency. Um, it's a horse to jump through a fence and like kind of de-glove or, or, or had a big chunk of uh, meat and muscle and skin um, through his flank approaching towards his inguinal area. Luckily for this horse, it didn't affect any synovial structures, but it's pretty dramatic. Um, I was able to suture this horse with local block in the stall. Um, I trimmed the picture because I was literally covered in blood and it was too gross to show. Um, this horse had some um, drainage left in place for seroma formation. And the way I repair this, I did some tacking sutures around here and reduced all the dead space and to kind of kind of put the flap around the body wall. And then eventually I closed the skin. Um, so this, this actually horse uh, ended up healing quite well and got some infection that resolved, but um, it, was a, it was a good, uh, good wound. This is an example of another wound in the fall. This is a wound that uh, basically got a little bit of ben benign neglect for uh, um, for a few hours, 24 hours. Uh, here's the moment that happened. They couldn't get a vet, they couldn't get a trailer. So basically they kept the fall overnight. Um, you can see is a full thickness, dorsal laceration all to the cannon bone. And by the time he arrived, the cannibal was pretty bruised. I can see here, it's kind of black, purple-ish bone. I was very scared that this piece of bone was going to die. Um, it didn't, luckily, but um, I thought for sure this was going to die. This wound actually end up, we suture it up and end up dehesing or falling apart uh, three to five days later. And we manage it as an open wound. Uh, some of the sutures stay together. And at that point, you're kind of hoping to decrease the time and, and keep the, 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 the skin as close as possible to increase healing time. Sorry, to decrease healing time. Managing the puncture wounds. This one's are, you have to think about like a dog bite. You don't want to never close those wounds because they're deep, they're infected or contaminated and they're hard to keep clean. So this one's we manage openly. This is a horse with a, um, got a run through, a, had a branch of a tree stuck to his guttal pouch. And you can see his internal carotid, inter external carotid, lingual facial, like all the big vessels live in this area. You can see them right there, miss all of them. Uh, and then we put a drain from here all the way to here and we just manage it as an open wound. Uh, so this ones you want to keep open and with a daily lavage. Dr. Mejia, there was a question about the last case in the fall um, yeah. where the extensor tendons affected in yeah. that wound. That was completely transected. So luckily the extensor tendons are not as important as the flexor tendons, they do have a function. And the function of the extensor tendon is extend the toe and the cranial face of the stride to have to have them like kind of land flat. If they don't have that extensor tendon, they tend to drag. Um, so there's things that we can do to fix that. Um, but a lot of the times when you have the extensor tendons to kind of yeah, be in the same uh, vicinity, uh, they tend to heal and don't have problems. Uh, they may have some mechanical lameness, but not like um, a pain lameness. But for that, you can, there's special shoeing that you can do to address that. But the extensor tendon, if you want to, if you want a tendon to be cut, it's going to be the extensor. If you have a, a flexor tendon cut, that's a different story. Um, but in this one, we didn't have any issues uh, with the healing process. What's the other question? 
that's all for now. Okay. And then management of open wounds. Uh, ideally, if you can clean them once or twice daily with saline or basic um, balanced electrolyte solutions with plus or minus an antiseptic solution. Never use peroxide. It's pretty cytotoxic or toxic to the cells and they will kill good and bad cells there uh, or bacteria. Always try to keep it to cover the wounds. Um, avoid any drying agents such as wonder dust uh, or silver spray directly over open wound. Um, always encourage clean and moisture environments. Um, and always remember that a healthy granulation bed will help and facilitate epithelialization and cell migration uh, versus a exuberant granulation tissue and a contaminated wound. Um, and then one way to know if your granulation tissue is exuberant or not, if you can see that the, the kind of the, the granulation tissue is flat with the edges of the skin, that's what you want. If the granulation tissue is above the skin edges, that's too much. That needs to be flattened. And a way, a good way to think about it is, it's easier for the cells to kind of glide through a flat, moist surface than have to kind of climb a mountain of tissue to the center because the wounds heal from the from the outside in and they kind of contract. So if they have to go up, it's going to be harder for them. This is a, I remember the horse that I show you in the stall with a big laceration, the gloving injury in the forelimb. This one also had over the fedlock, the pastern, the tendon sheath, the, the flexor tendons, the extensor tendons. Pull a number of herself. Here's the bone right here. And this horse, we manage it with an open wound and we try to protect as much as the, uh, the skin that was in, intact. Um, and here, uh, this is after we kind of clip him and, and clean it a little bit. Here is about four weeks after trauma, all this kind of white edges are epithelialization. And where it's highlighted by the circles, um, it's kind of where the, the granulation tissue looks unhealthy. Here you see kind of pink granulation tissue, and then you have like kind of like yellowish, more reddish granulation tissue. Uh, always look for the colors, you know. You have pink is good, yellow is not good, red is not good, purple is not good. You want the kind of nice pink, uh, even granulation tissue. So this is- We have is, a question, yep. sorry to interrupt you. We have no, a no, question no. about use of sugar in an open wound. That's, that's a great question. So the benefits of sugar is, uh, are a few. One, it could be an osmotic agent to draw some of the inflammation and edema secondary to the wound because it will create a hypertonic or uh, um, um, environment. Also the sugar, high concentration of sugar is shown that it creates like has antibiotic properties or antimicrobial properties. Um, and it will help to bride some of the wounds. So uh, especially in the country that I'm from, Colombia, actually a lot of people love sugar. Uh, and another sugar product, which is or, or sugar cane product, which is called panela, and that's they use that in wounds to help granulation. And and I've treated in the past like that, and it works beautifully. Honestly, we have other products that that are more medically approved, uh, but I don't think there's nothing. Um, I think there is a place and a time for sugar. Um, it's actually very practical, also in feet. If you mix uh, sugar with iodine, they famous sugar dine uh, for food abscesses and stuff like that is actually wonderful. This is a light where the red shows we should be worried, the yellow maybe worried but not as much, and then green there's not it's nothing too serious they should be worried about. And, and don't take this literally, but for example, um, here near the fetlock joints, the fetlock, the carpus, uh, sorry, the, the um, the tarsus and the carpus, wounds around these areas, you should be pretty worried about. They're very close to a synovial structure. Um, areas near, for example, the stifle, the elbow, the shoulder joint, yes, you should be worried about, um, but they have more soft tissue protection than going inside those joints is a little harder. 
Uh, so you kind of have a little bit of leeway here. It's not impossible, but you have a little bit of leeway. And then wounds, for example, all over, oh, sorry. Wounds, for example, over the uh, hip, the thorax, the flank, the neck, as long as they're not very, very deep, um, there is no, you know, those structures here that should be worried about. It's more like if they go very deep into the abdominal cavity or the thoracic cavity, then that's a problem. Uh, but uh, the benefit of here is that they have a lot of muscle, a lot of circulation, they tend to heal very well. This is a different examples of different locations of wounds. So for example, here with it highlighted by the red arrows are wounds that I'd be very worried about. For example, this one, uh, I'm sorry, my automatic uh, lights in the office go off. Um, so on the top left, you have kind of this in the back of the fetlock where you can have the tendon sheet involved. And this one, the pastern joint here, the tendon sheath the fetlock, and even you, you can see there's a little bit of swelling over the dorsal aspect of the fetlock. Um, and then this one is in the front of the, and the hock. So those wounds are more likely that could be involving us in our structure versus this one in the front um, of the cannon bone in the back. Uh, the, the tarsus is right here. So you're pretty far away from the joint. This one is kind of in the middle of the cannon bone. You will be worried about the tendons, but probably not a synovial structure. Uh, and then this ones are pretty dramatic, but are um, pretty superficial. We have a, another question on wound management. Can you use betadine in an open wound? Uh, diluted betadine, yes, about 1%. Stray betadine, is going to be cytotoxic. And one thing you don't know, uh, for example, then a lot of people don't know is the more concentrated, well, one, the more concentrated, the more irritant it is, but it's not necessarily means it's more effective. So the iodine needs mechanical or chemical activation. So you need to kind of release the, the bonding of the iodine particles to be effective. So dilution makes that and also scrubbing makes that iodine active or available to be effective. That doesn't mean because it's more concentrated is better. Actually, it's not. But you can use it, yes. Usually, we try to use solutions for diluted solutions. So a good way to think about it is I usually use about 5 mLs to 10 mLs of uh, betadine solution um, per one liter of water or saline. And that's going to give you like a like a weak tea uh, appearance. For food abscesses, you can bandage them with uh, usually a gauze over the defect, plus or minus an antiseptic. In this case, you can use sugar dine or betadine, um, any diapers or animalintics as your absorbent or osmotic layer. And then you hold that in place with a gauze roll or cast padding. In this case, we're using cast padding. And then vet wrap to hold that, which is the color bandage, and then duct tape on the bottom, that will impermeabilize your bandage to, to avoid fluid going inside this foot. And then you seal the top of the bandage with elastic to avoid things to go inside. And then for pulling bandages, this is a couple of examples I'm gonna show you. So kind of this is what I like to use, your gauze, and plus or minus dressing over your wound, um, any gauze roll to hold that dressing in place. And then after that, you're gonna use your combi roll uh, or cotton bandage. And then your brown gauze is gonna be your kind of compressive uh, layer. And the key for a bandage is you wanna be even. So if you're putting your tension in your bandage, you wanna put your tension in the bandage in every spot, every time. If you have like loose, tight, tight, loose, uh, that's going to put uneven pressure in different locations of the wound, and that's more likely to bow a tendon versus an even distributed bandage. With uh, And then you will find out that if you have good padding, especially a combi roll, is more likely that you will tear the brown gauze before you put it too tight. But, I mean, you can always do it, but um, my in my experience, I tend to rip the brown gauze before I can put it too tight. And then finish up with some vet wrap, always leaving about a quarter inch in top and bottom of the cotton exposed. 
and then you seal your bandage top and bottom with elastic on. And then if you're doing a full in bandage, you kind of want to, before you go to your uh, vet wrap layer, you finish your brown gauze layer on the bottom and then you overlap your bandage in the top uh, by about two to three inches. And then you finish uh, your cotton, then your brown gauze, and then you put a single layer of your vet wrap kind of connecting both bandages and then you seal it top and bottom uh, with elastic on. There, Cornell Rockian has great videos illustrating how to place full limb, foot bandages, and distal limb bandages. This is a couple of pictures of a special type of bandaging. So here is a compression bandage for, for example, a splint fracture um, that you remove and then you kind of put some local pressure there. Uh, you hold that in place with a cling and then you do an inner sanctum, which is this. And then you put your distal limb bandage. And here are examples of hawk and then carpus bandages. Uh, and always always try to spare the accessory carpal bone if you can, uh, because they can get rubs there pretty easy. Ophthalmologic emergencies. Um, so most common ones are going to be, um, and always think about that an eye, it's always an emergency. So what a normal eye looks like, the cornea should be clear and transparent. Um, they should not have any opacities unless there is a previous injury that heal. Any um, signs of inflammation, there should not be any inflammation in the anterior chamber or around tissues, conjunctivitis, any epiphora, which is kind of tearing of the eye or any abnormal secretions, um, uh, always you should be looking for. Eye conditions should be evaluated as, as soon as possible. They're always an emergency uh, and that you always, because they can change very rapidly. Uh, what was a small superficial ulcer that didn't get taken care of can progress very quickly. And horses are very painful. So the most common ones we see are corneal ulcers. And usually uh, for you to think about the cornea has four layers or grossly four layers. And um, they can change very rapidly. And so the diagnosis might be done um, as soon as possible to be able to start treatment immediately. Um, they tend to be pretty painful when they uh, have corneal ulcers. Um, and then once they heal, there is a risk of they can have a little bit of a, um, an opacity as a scar sometimes when they're deep ulcers. Um, a lot of horses that have corneal ulcers, they what happens is they start rubbing the eye and scratching it and they make it worse uh, throughout the night. They would keep rubbing and rubbing and the next morning the horse's eye is totally different than the day prior. Never use dexamethasone. So a lot of the times people have, have like, oh, I have this, this uh, neopolydex ointment from another horse that had let's say a, a glaucoma or any other condition that might require some corticosteroids, but not an ulcer. So you always want to check where you're putting in the eye and always talk to your vet before you put anything to an eye, um, even though he's in the way, like if you want to be proactive, check if you have something in your barn from another case, check if you can use that or not before you use it. Other conditions are going to be uveitis, and it can be secondary to any ulcer or self-mediated, -media, uh, um, such as uh, equine recurrent uveitis. Um, the eye tend to be more blue, um, and they if that's not taken care of, those horses can progress to glaucoma. Um, and then eventually, if glaucoma progresses, they can lose vision. But uh, ophthalmology is not my, my area of expertise, but it's kind of like a general, very general um, knowledge. Any laceration on the eyelids, for sure. Um, foreign bodies. Um, oh, but regardless, if you find a foreign body in the eye, you always want to stain it to make sure there's no ulcers on that eye that could have developed from the foreign body. And then glaucomas are more kind of chronic conditions and they can um, usually are associated with an imbalance of the dynamic of the aqueous humor, which is increases the intraocular pressure and uh, can progress to create compression of the optic nerve. Um, and then eventually those horses can become blind. But 
Dr. Nickelbein, actually, she's the expert on this. Um, but some breeds that are predisposed for this are quarter horses, Appaloosas, um, some thoroughbreds are kind of um, predisposed by your Appaloosa and your quarter horse are kind of your foster, foster child for it. And then fevers, um, there are many causes of fevers and there are causes that we don't know. Uh, and we know there's a fever, but we don't know, we don't know what's causing it. So we call those fever of unknown origins, but the known origin, so our infectious causes are going to be your viruses, bacteria, parasites, and inflammatory causes can be associated with the infectious causes. Um, or any immune-mediated immune disease, which are not that common in horses, to be honest. Um, any hyperthermia, um, especially after exercise or, um, um, or severe muscle damage uh, tying up. Some horses might develop um, like a malignant uh, hyperthermia type of situation. So what can we do in cases of fevers? Um, when possible, isolate and limit the contact of that horse with other horses, especially if it's an infectious cause or suspected of infectious cause. So horses that recently travel somewhere else, came from a show, were imported from another country. So all those horses that should be isolated ideally. Call your veterinarian as soon as possible. Uh, some horses will respond to cold bath or alcohol bath. Um, and anti-inflammatories will help these horses feel better and start eating. So some banamine is not going to hurt, especially to kind of help with the fever. Esophageal obstructions and choke. Um, it, usually this is a result of a kind of being feed, being uh, trapped in the esophagus. Uh, and that could be feed for a body. Um, and a lot of the common causes are going to be human error. So a classic example of this is a new owner of a horse and somebody told them like, yeah, feed and beet pole, it's great for them, which is great. But then they forgot to mention they need to be soaked. And then what happens is these horses eat this beet pulp and this thing expands. And then next thing you know, they have an esophagus chock full of, this, of a beet pulp and I can tell you how many times, I cannot tell you how many times I've seen this situation. Um, all the problems could be horses that have kind of pica type of behavior, which is kind of this indiscriminate eating. Uh, they eat very compulsively, very fast, uh, or they eat shavings or they eat wood. Um, we have actually, we have a mini when I was a resident. Uh, I didn't manage the case. I helped with it peripherally. Uh, but this meanie was have compulsive eating disorders and he will eat anything in front of him. Um, so eat his hair, will eat the feet, the, the ground, it will eat anything that he could eat. He will eat it. He obstructed his intestine. He obstructed his esophagus. It was just a chaos. Um, any poor quality hay or forage, um, horses with dental problems are very prone to this. Any neurologic problems that could affect uh, swallowing um, or any acquire or congenital defects. So um, any damage to kind of the glossopharyngeal nerves, the hypoglossal nerves, um, uh, even the facial nerves, uh, those can be uh, associated with difficulty swallowing sometimes. So clinical signs are going to be kind of this kind of green, yellow feed foam material coming through their nostrils, and they can ex they, you see them kind of extend in their neck. They'll be coughing, and have respiratory distress, gagging, excessive salivation. Some might look dumpy or colicky, uh, and most likely there will develop uh, aspiration pneumonia because some of the feed will go to their uh, trachea because a lot of the horses are obstructed and they continue to eat. So some of that feed kind of doesn't have anywhere to go. So end up going in their lungs. Um, Recurrence is actually quite common because they resolve the problem and the owners start feeding the horses again and the esophagus could be inflamed. So they reobstruct. Um, one thing to notice is uh, even though it's an urgency, it's not a life-threatening situation most cases. The reason for that is some horses can spend all night choked 
uh, and not necessarily die of it. Uh, like humans, when they have choke, they don't, they can't breathe very well. Horses, they can. Uh, so, and a lot of the times we, what we do, we evaluate and we're not able to resolve. We put a muscle on them and then we just let them overnight kind of settle, give muscle relaxants, give sedation, pain management, and that will help them kind of relax and start passing that obstruction. Some of them can take about three to four days to fully resolve. Um, actually, I'm going to show you a case that it took, took me three days to resolve. Um, so what to do, what, what to do in these cases. So do not feed them or give them water because it's going to go to the lungs. So the most important thing is remove everything they can eat, put a muscle on them, um, and then call your vet as soon as possible. If for some reason he cannot go that night or that day, don't feed him, keep them calm. You can give him some banamine if you can. Uh, a lot of the times, uh, some owners are comfortable giving IV. If you can, don't, if you don't have any of those, you can give some sedation IEM such as xylazine or acepromazine. Um, and then most of them will resolve on their own or with uh, some mild medical attention. There's a few of them that will require more advanced uh, or referral uh, for getting resolved. Um, but, um, and then if DVM, like I said, cannot go there, just remove everything, the shavings, anything they can eat. Uh, if that, if you don't have a muscle and that means their horses are going to sleep without a bed, leave them without a bed. That's more, that's better than having me eat shavings. And then how do we treat them? Uh, usually put them on feed, try to pass a tube that will be done by your vet. Um, sedate the horse, give some muscle relaxants. We'll get some imaging going to figure out how extensive is the obstruction. And we'll usually use a combination of endoscopy and radiographs and use the chest ultrasound to see if there's changes in the lungs. They can happen pretty early. Um, and then passing a nasogastric tube with a control of vodge is usually the treatment of choice. And then those horses needs to be in anti-inflammatories and antibiotics. And the most important thing of all is a control refeeding. Uh, they need something soft, something that easy to swallow, easy to digest, um, and to prevent further obstructions. Here is a horse that kind of presented um, with a severe obstruction. And there you can see here is the larynx. This is kind of the opening of the esophagus. All of this is obstruction. All of this, all the way up to the thoracic inlet. So this horse took me three days to unobstruct. He was eating shavings uh, and got himself choked with shavings. This is the last part of the talk. We're gonna talk about lameness um, and it's gonna be fairly quick. And then, so always remember that acute lameness is usually not uh there are not going to be many causes of it they're going to be usually an abscess uh, a fracture or a septic synovitis structure especially if the horses are very 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 lame um always remember that 80 percent of the lameness will come from the foot in this case the horse that had with a severe foot abscess that uh it was kind of involving 60 percent of the sole and we had to make, make a big opening here and it kind of modifies spider shoe um, and then they will always need medical attention. Um, and some of them could be either life-threatening or welfare conditions in some horses because of the degree of pain. Chronic lamenesses can't wait most of the time. Uh, they're not like something that I need to bring at two in the morning. Um, but some of them will require uh, treatment as soon as possible. Um, and some of the exceptions to the rule are going to be your kind of odd laminitis case that are being stable for a while and suddenly became unstable. Uh, those horses will require medical attention sooner rather than later. Other ones will have horses that have kind of chronic abscess that blew through the coronary band and developed this kind of granulation, exuberant granulation tissue with this granuloma. Um, and this horse is, um, I'm going to show you in a minute, uh, can be more challenging. 
and some of them are less rewarding. Uh, and this radiograph, you will see, this came for laminitis, a, a rescue, a miniature horse. And when we took rats for the feed, we found out this wire that it was sitting in there for years and we ended up taking it out. This is the case I was talking about, some collapsing of the foot abscess and form this granuloma on uh, this horse and it's having kind of lateral collapse uh, of the coronary band. And this horse required a segmental hoof wall resection with some trimming of this area to get this foot stabilized and provide uh, a more wide shoe on the medial side to increase the surface area and support on this foot. Always remember that a foot abscess that goes untreated can progress to, to the bone and become a septic coffin bone. Um, a bone fissure can always progress to a complete fracture, a tendinitis or a dysmitis without appropriate treatment and rehabilitation can limit the chances of return to work. And the longer the synovial structure remains uncontaminated, the harder it is to remove the infection, which worsens the prognosis. In this case, is a horse that started with a hood abscess that wasn't treated, progressed to the um, um, osteo, septic osteitis of the foot right there, and then we end up debriding it. And then for neurologic emergencies, just to wrap it up, uh, this clinical signs will vary among horses, but uh, common causes are gonna be trauma, infectious causes such as the viral encephalitis, the triple E, West Nile, Western equine encephalitis, Venezuelan encephalitis, especially in, in the South American countries, rabies, always keeping a radar, any her herpes virus type one, horses that are traveling, any EPM or bacterial meningitis, especially in youngsters. Um, and then more developmental, which are going to be your cervical vertebrae stenotic myelopathy or the wobblers horses. And those could be static or dynamic, depending on where the compression is. That means static is they always neurologic and dynamic is they become neurologic with certain movements of the neck. So if they collect them. So the neck is flexed. They become neurologic or more acquire like temporal hyoid osteopathy or THO horses. They usually see them in older ones. Common clinical signs of these horses are going to be you kind of your ataxia, which is in coordination, um, any recumbency, head pressing, like in the first picture, circle. And most of the times, or a lot of the times, the circle to the side of the lesion, um, depression, any dysphagia, difficulty swallowing, facial paralysis or deviation of the muscle, um, any abnormal reactions to or behaviors to stimuli like light, sound, uh, movement, uh, they can be highly excitatory. This case is a case that we had um, of a filly that presented for head trauma. Um, and in this filly, uh, you can see how unstable she is. She is, you know, has a head tilt, uh, Horner syndrome, which is kind of your typical ear droop, ptosis of the eye. Uh, sweating and other clinical signs, but she was quite unstable. She had a fracture at the base of her cranium. So call your vet always. You never know what's going on. So it's better to call your vet. Uh, you can assess the degree of neurologic signs to tell your vet. You can tell them, hey, you know, this horse is down, can't stand up uh, versus the horse is circling the stall or is head pressing and always be try to be safe. Uh, so Let's say if there's a concern about rabies or a, a, an animal wound, you know, always safety first. So do not handle the horse. Call the people that know how to handle these animals. Um, try to isolate when possible, especially if you're suspicious of an infectious cause. Um, avoid any excitement of the horse. Avoid touching the horse if necessary um, to any exacer to produce any exacerbation of clinical signs. What not to do is do not walk the horse. A lot of them are going to be unstable. Do not give any medication without your vet uh, approval. And do not touch the horse if concerned about rabies or any infectious disease. Uh, to avoid cross-contamination to other animals or possible healthy in the barn. Um, and a lot of the clinical signs can progress very fast and they can become fatal. 
therefore, middle attention needs to be uh, as soon as possible to improve outcome. And with that, uh, sorry that I extend myself a little bit, but I will take any questions. This is a picture of Ruffian here at the Belmont racetrack um, prior her breakdown. Thank you so much, Dr. Mejia. Sorry about that, everyone. My uh, Wi-Fi just cut out, but I made it back just in time. Um, it looks like we've got some comments coming in um, saying thank you so much for the talk. Um, everyone really enjoyed it. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. And again, our next talk um, will be next month. Let me just pull up the date here. Um, Tuesday, November 21st, uh, Dr. Mandy Demestra will be presenting on prevention of pregnancy loss in mares. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.